Hello and welcome back to our study of the Dhammapada. Today we continue with verse 217, which reads as follows. Sīla dasana sampannang dhamma tang sacca vedinang Atano kama kumbanang tang jano kurute piyang, which means Sila dasana sampana, one who is uh, accomplished in ethics and vision, or who has ethics and vision. Dhammatang, one who stands in the Dhamma or stands on the Dhamma. Satchavedi, one who knows the truth. Atano Kamakubana, on doing the doing one's own work. Tang jano kurde piang, tang pugalang that person. Jano, the people. The people hold such a person dear. Kurde pia, hold such a person dear. Is dear to all people. So this verse was said to have been told in response to a story about Mahakasapa. Well, Mahakasapa was a special person, special example of a follower of the Buddha. He was born a Brahmin, and like the the man in one of our earlier stories He didn't want to get married And Had no interest in sensuality Romance uh, and, and so he Said he would marry if they could find someone Beautiful like a statue or That sort of thing And they found such a woman but she didn't want to get married either. She had no interest in romance or sensuality either. Badda was her name. And so she sent him a letter saying, Look, I'm not really interested in getting married. Uh, just to let you know, it's not, not my thing. Go find someone else. He sent her a similar letter. Look, really, I didn't mean it when I said I'd marry a beautiful woman. I was just trying to get them off my back. Not really my thing. Find someone else. But their parents intercepted these letters, opened them up, read them, and decided that that wouldn't be, that, that just wouldn't do. <clears throat> and so they tore up those letters, burnt them, and wrote new letters saying, oh, I'm very happy that you've agreed to marry me, and sent them on their way. They received the letters and got married. Even when they were married, they didn't, didn't have any interest in sensuality, romance. And one day Mahakasapa, Kasapa Hippipali was his name. One day he is supposed to have watched his farmers, because he was a rich Brahmin landholder. He watched his farmer, the people working on his farm, killing. And killing insects, killing lizards, killing rodents. He watched how... 
uh, when they plowed the field that killed all the worms in the in the earth and dug them all up and then the birds would eat them and you realized that he was a part and parcel to all of this you realized how profoundly unjust unethical on a deeper level living in the world was you know, he saw that even though he himself wasn't doing anything wrong he wasn't killing or hurting others still there was an imperfection and it was caught up in murder and death and his wife saw some saw something similar at the same time so they both came to each other and they said look enough I'm not going to I'm not going to live as a lay person anymore and so they sewed robes uh, simple cloth found some bowls and they ordained themselves not, not as Buddhist monks of course but they became ascetics and they both left they left their home they left their riches they left everything and when they came to a crossroads they said look we can't live together there's too much danger in being together and so they went their own ways eventually she became a bhikkhuni I think but Pipali became Mahakasupa. He did change his name. Not all Buddhists, not all followers of the Buddha changed their name, I think, when they became monks, but Kasupa did. Or maybe they say Kasupa might have been his family name. Um, but Mahakasupa was a special follower, as I said. He was very much like the Buddha. He looked like the Buddha, apparently. He had some of the physical qualities of a Buddha based on the, the great perfections he had cultivated. In a way, he, he seems to have been the most accomplished in perfection of all the non-Buddhas. Non-Buddhas, non all, the, all the disciples of the Buddha. He's the only monk who shared... Uh, a robe with the Buddha, who, who wore the Buddha's robe. And the Buddha gave him his, his tattered rags robe as a, as a means of uh, giving, giving Mahakasapa that distinction, but also to give him the, the impetus to wear the, uh, a rag robe, you know, a robe that was made out of discarded cloth and that was made of pieces of cloth so, so not one big sheet of cloth but cut up into pieces and he kept that robe and he patched it up continuously patching it when it ripped or when it got worn when the Buddha passed away he was also the foremost uh, of the Sangha everyone recognized him as the father of the Sangha at the time when the Buddha passed away. Sariputta was gone, Moggallana was gone, the two chief disciples, so he was who was left. But even apart from 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 Sariputta and Moggallana, he was he was a special follower of the Buddha. A very special monk, a great teacher, a great practitioner. And so this verse was said in regards to him. The story is a very simple story. The Buddha and, and a large following of enlightened and highly accomplished monks were going on alms round. And it was a festival and there was a group of young boys, teenagers maybe, maybe 20-somethings. And they had cakes. They were carrying cakes, maybe carrying them on their head or and they passed by the monks, and when they saw the Buddha, they saluted him. They paid paid homage to him, but didn't give him any cakes. And all the other monks, they just passed them by. And the Buddha said to the monks, "Oh, you want you want some cakes? <laughs> yeah, sometimes when all you get is rice and beans, cakes look attractive." The Buddha said, "But the Buddha, the, the Buddha, of course, wasn't interested in." cravings or that sort of thing, but he wanted to make a point, I guess. He said, uh, and they said, well, there's no cakes to, get, to be had, and the Buddha said, well, those boys had cakes. Said, oh, Venerable Sir, those, those boys, 
never get those kind of boys. They never give out cakes to to religious people. They never give alms. Young people are very much infatuated with life. The idea of doing some meritorious deed, some some cultivating some wholesomeness of mind to carry them over, to be a sort of a, a seed. You no, know? good deeds, charity, and all that are seeds. They they you plant them and they grow fruit and they grow flowers. They grow in your mind. They grow goodness. They're great for future existence for those people who are concerned with where they're going in their next life. It's a very established practice. It was at the time of the Buddha, the doing of good deeds for the benefit, of, even among Buddhists, of course. It's not a non-Buddhist practice. It's very much a Buddhist practice. Because where you're born will very much influence your capacity to practice. If you're born without can be very difficult to practice. Of course, if you obsess about such things, you can be born with so much that you don't even think about practice because it's too comfortable, right? So they're, they're a basic sort of beneficial, uh, helpful practice. But young people aren't interested in such things. Generally, they're caught up in the intoxication of youth and life and pleasure. Things like cakes. But then the Buddha Kasapa, uh, then Mahakasapa, not the Buddha Kasapa, Mahakasapa came. Came along. I don't, I don't remember he was with the monks or he was on his own, but he came out of the city. And the young boys, as soon as they saw him, they paid reverence to him and gave him all the cakes. Maybe not all the cakes. They gave him a whole bunch of cakes, and he said, "Well, then give the, give these cakes out to the other monks." And so the boys went. Then they gave cakes to all the monks, at the Buddha. And the monks were quite surprised, of course. And the Buddha said, "Why, why would you be surprised?" And then he recited this verse. And so this, the story tells us, I think, three things. The, the, the essence of it is this question of why they gave the cakes to Kasapa and not to the Buddha or the Sangha at large. And so I, I guess you could look at it. There, there's three aspects to it. It's, not, it's complex, complicated because obviously they didn't give them to Mahakasapa simply because of his virtues because... Hello, the Buddha had, had all those virtues and more. But, um, so, the first, the first, and this is interesting, because it says something about human character. The first is that the reasons why we do things are, are often just uh, based on biases, right? Based not, not, not necessarily in a bad way, but based on our own um predilections or our own character type. Like they say that the monks who followed certain teachers in the time of the Buddha, those who were interested in things like Abhidhamma or wisdom, followed Sariputta. Those who were uh, inclined towards mental power, mental fortitude, magical powers, that sort of thing, followed Mo Moggallana. Those who were interested in study, memorization of the Buddha's teachings, they followed Ananda. Those who were interested in evil, they followed Devadatta. So, um, the peop the, the, these, these kids who, who gave something to Mahakasapa were very much, most likely, acting upon their own character. And there was some resonance there that often has no real bearing on truth or goodness. And of course the danger here where it becomes a real issue, an important Dhammic point is that uh, in religious context we often follow teachers and leaders not because of their actual true qualities but because of we, our agreement and our um, harmony with them. You know, it harmonizes with our own character, which may not be 
you know, if our own character is perfect, we should question question the fact that we like certain leaders and teachers. Just because we agree with, just because someone agrees with us, doesn't make us right. Mahakaspa wasn't such a person. There was no danger there. There's a sense that regardless of the fact that they didn't give to the Buddha, there's an absolutely a greatness to these young boys. They obviously weren't ordinary individuals, or else they would have been mocking of the Buddha and mocking of the monks. Sorry, not ordinary, but if they were base individuals. You know, people often thinking that religious people are lazy. These monks are, are living off of gifts, you know. It appears that they expect people to give them things and that sort of thing. They expect life to just be given to them. That's how it appears to many people. Which is really strange because uh, anyone who does any work expects something to be given to them. And, and yet when we see monks who expect very little in return for whatever it is they may do, and that they're they're criticized, criticized not because of uh, not because of the nature of their work, but but, but because of their yeah, their nonconformity, you know, their non-integration. That's really what it comes down to. It's just so glaringly different and and um, rebellious. That it's uh, it, it it gives rise to this sense of this desire to criticize, but honestly, you know, many monks work very very hard and do very very good things for the world, and yet they're still criticized because look, they expect people to give them things, which is really really a strange. It's illogical, and it it's not so strange or, or mysterious. It comes from the fact that they they don't appear like there's no sense, there's no sign of employment these people i've been told many times i should get a job just kind of funny you know some people work very very hard and make lots and lots of money and that's certainly their prerogative monks monks it's not just that we do a different kind of job but yes we um, not just a monk but a person on on a spiritual path has decided that they want to do less material work. They want less material wealth. And because of both those things, they take on a practice which is content with the minimal requirement for survival. And so they work, they work for their own benefit, but they work for the benefit of others. They do things that are noble and good and worthy of esteem. And so these, these young boys saw this. They saw that this was noble. And many people see this. They see the, the benefit of giving to such people. You know, the greatness of it. The, the greatness of appreciating greatness. Even if these people, these monks, maybe they wouldn't teach the boys anything. There's a greatness to it. And that greatness is shared by the, the giver, of course, because... There's a feeling of greatness in the act, goodness, feeling good about yourself, right? You don't feel good about yourself when you give to evil people, when you pay taxes to an evil king or so on. You don't feel so good about that. But when you give to someone who is really pure, there's a sense of greatness about it. That is a benefit, really, to the giver. So... So th there's a greatness. But the second thing is that uh, often there's an uh, aspect of karma involved. So quite possibly these these boys had some connection with Mahakasapa. But the Buddha does something. It's worth noting what the Buddha does here is he ignores those sorts of answers. You know, that maybe in a past life there was some connection between these boys or... Most likely they're just doing it because that's their character type. He often would do this sort of thing because he's, he appears to be ignoring 
or the whole picture. You know, he's not giving the whole picture of answering their question. You know, if someone were to ask, why did he give to Mahakasapa? Well, he gave to Mahakasapa because Mahakasapa is a great monk. Right? The real question is, why didn't he give it to the Buddha? But that's not important. Leave it to the Buddha to not really answer the question, but focus on the important question. Right? The most important thing here is not all of these details of uh, why, why, why. But the important qualities that um, that we should focus on. And those are that Mahakasapa had these qualities. These these this verse is a an apt description, you know, a very bold and powerful description of Mahakasapa. And so the lesson for us here is the understanding of what it means to be a great person, but also an understanding of these dhammas, so that we may emulate them, of course. Sila, sam sila, da sila dasana sampana. So, this, the first word uh, points out two complementary aspects of mental development or spiritual development, and that one is ethics, and the other is vision. This is something fairly specific to the Buddha, I think, that he would single out these two and 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 make this the dichotomy. You know, at other times he says sila and and dhamma, that sort of thing. Sila being things that you abstain from, dhamma being things that you cultivate. But singling out dasana here gives a, a insight into the nature of the Buddha's dhamma. Dhamma being teaching here, so the Buddha's dhamma, unlike other sorts of dhamma was about dasana. Was very much focused on seeing, vision. So the sila aspect is the um, quality of abstaining or restraining in some ways. You know, there are four kinds of sila. One is the keeping of rules, which is what we understand as abstaining. But there are other kinds of more subtle ethics, like livelihood. How you live your life, you know. Do you live your life similar to a a recluse, a renunciant, someone who is content with whatever they get, or are you obsessing and and ambitious about getting more, about acquiring possessions, material wealth, sensuality, uh, about the use of our our um, belongings? Buddha pointed out that an important aspect of ethics is how we relate to our possessions, how we relate to our, not just our, our means of livelihood, but the fruit of our livelihood. You know, our dwelling, is it opulent? Or are we content with simple dwelling? Our clothes, are we using them to keep warm or are we using them to show off our putrid, disgusting bodies? Uh, food, are we using it for maintaining life or are we using it for maintaining beauty or strength or fatness or that sort of thing, for fun, for entertainment? Medicine, are we using it for warding off illness or are we using it to be healthy and energetic? You know, stimulants and this sort of thing. Meaning, are we using it to be at peace or are we using it to fulfill our ambitions and become more ambitious and that sort of thing? And the fourth morality, really the deepest one, is the guarding of the senses. So it's a, an abstention, but it's an abstention from engagement. When you see, 
you engage with the seeing, but you don't engage with the uh, biases, with the reactions. You don't engage in 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 a react reactionary way. Like when we see something and then we get upset about it, or attached to it, or we taste food and we we uh, crave it, or we be disgusted by it. You don't react in those ways means you restrain the senses. It doesn't mean you don't see things, you don't hear things. It means that your seeing and hearing is just seeing and hearing, that you're really present. Your focus, your emphasis, your perspective is on the actual true experience, the reality. You know? People will say, oh, then in this case, Buddha say they lose all, they ignore everything. They lose the real essence of life, which is absurd. Most people, ordinary interactions with reality, that, that's uh, devoid of any truth, any, any reality to it. We see something and immediately we're caught up, not in the experience, but in our reaction to it, our craving or our aversion. When we see, we don't just see. When we hear, we don't really hear. We smell, we taste. It's all just a means. We use it as a means to trigger our emotions, to trigger our reactions, to stimulate our addictions, to satisfy momentarily our addictions. So sila, this is a very important because sila keeps you in a pasture. The Buddha used the word pasture. Keeps you in a pasture means it keeps you in a realm where you're safe. There's a story of a quail. And this quail lived in a, in a hilly area. And because it lived in a hilly area, there were holes and there were rocks. It could hide, you know. And that sort of place a quail is safe. But one day a quail, there was this quail, and it left the rocky area, went down into the plains, because there's better food there, more seeds. You know. The quail's pecking at these seeds, and suddenly it gets picked up by an eagle. And the eagle's going to carry this quail away and eat it. And the quail says, if only I had stuck to my pasture, to my gochara, my pasture. And the eagle says to him, what do you mean? Come on, I'm an eagle. You can't hide from me. And the, the quail says, oh yeah? You don't, know, you don't know anything. If I had stayed, you were no match for me in my, own, in my home turf. And the eagle says, oh yeah? And he says, well, we'll just see about that. And he brings the quail down to the rocky area and puts him down and says, okay, Mr. Quail, Miss Quail, let's see what you got. And the quail stands there in front of this rock and the eagle swoops down, goes way up high and then swoops down to catch the quail and the quail hides behind a rock and the, the eagle smashes its beak on the rock and dies or something. Kind of a terrible sort of story, but the Buddha told this story, I think, and it's, a, in, it's for the purpose of illustrating what he meant by pasture. You know? A place where you are safe. And it's apt in meditation because the pasture for a meditator is, of course, the four foundations of mindfulness. That's what the Buddha said. And if you, if you, when you, if you uh, understand that, you can understand the important. You can understand the the wisdom there. Pasture doesn't mean you have to stay locked in in a room or something. No. You can go anywhere, do anything, as long as you're in the pasture of the four foundations of mindfulness. Outside of the four foundations of mindfulness, that's outside of our pasture. And so ethics help to keep us in the pasture. If you're breaking these important ethical rules, 
killing, stealing, lying, cheating. It's very hard to be mindful. That's the whole point. If you're not guarding the senses, even just physically, if you're looking around or listening to music or so, it's very hard to be mindful. So ethics is an important part of spiritual practice that can be missed in certain circumstances. It's often a complaint of Western Buddhists that we, that West, by, by Eastern Buddhists, that um, we don't focus enough on ethics. And I think it's a valid complaint in certain instances. So it's important that we study ethics, you know, what, how to abstain, how to, what we have to abstain, not from everything, not from experience, but from reaction and from evil, of course. Dasana, dasana, sila dasana. So dasana is the other side of the coin. Dasana is really the core of our practice. It's what we do. Dasana is about seeing. The many things that we try to see. It's not seeing everything, but, and of course, it doesn't mean seeing with the eyes. It means seeing with wisdom. Seeing through mindfulness. When you focus on reality, when you focus on experience, you start to see it more clearly. You come to see it more clearly than before. Most importantly, in regards to three things, you see impermanence. You see that reality isn't made up of things, people, places, objects. It's not real. That's not the basis of reality. The basis of reality is experience, and experiences are momentary. Because they're momentary, there's no satisfaction. There's no object that can satisfy you. An experience can't satisfy you. It comes and it goes. You don't get to keep it. We think we keep things. You know, I keep objects, people even I can keep. Because those things aren't the basis of reality, they change. They disappear. And when they disappear, because our uh, vision was blinded by uh, our perception of things, that thing, the disappearance of it, or the appearance of a new thing, disrupts our peace. Disrupts our, disturbs our mind, upsets us. Someone who is who sees clearly the basis of reality, experience, has no such suffering because they're in tune with the momentary experience. This comes and it goes. It's very simple, really. Very obvious, really. An obvious thing that we don't see. Uh, we see, when we see, yeah, impermanent suffering, non-self. These are three characteristics that are often really intellectualized, and they shouldn't be. It just means seeing experience, seeing reality from a basis of experience, and these are the qualities of experience that are not qualities of things. Things are stable, satisfying, controllable, which is great, except that they don't exist. So our con concept of this thing that is stable, satisfying, controllable is an illusion. And when it changes, then we suffer. Why, why did it change? It was a thing that was stable. Oops. This is dasana. We see this. And it frees us from that obsession, that, that attachment, that delusion. So Mahakasabha was Sila Dasana Sampana. The number two is Dhammata. Dhammata. Ta, to stand on standing in relation to standing. I think I'm 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 pretty sure that's what this word means. Dhammata. It's not a word you hear very often. But I think that's yes, that's what the commentary says about it. Dhammata, standing in the Dhamma. Standing in the Dhamma here, the commentary says it means standing in, in Nibbana, in, in the super mundane, which is, which is correct, which is absolutely true. That's the basis. Standing in the Dhamma doesn't just mean committing yourself to goodness or so on. It really means being established on something that is concrete, that is a good foundation, a solid foundation. And that's the word ta here. It's a very important word. 
the, the meaning here is very powerful why because our ordinary base uh, of refuge and support is the big problem you know we rely upon things that are unreliable speaking of impermanence we rely on impermanent things to be stable we rely on people we rely on fortune sometimes you know we have wealth we have stability and we rely upon it we rely on youth Always going to be young We rely on life Always going to be alive We rely on health Always going to be healthy We rely on things that are unreliable The only thing that is truly reliable Is the Dhamma And among the Dhamma The only really truly reliable Dhamma Is Nibbana Nibbana is the state of freedom from suffering Whereas our ordinary experience is constant experience Constant reflection and conception We see things, there's a constant narrative going on What do you think about this thing that you see or hear or so on? And so we're constantly reacting, no? we're constantly jumping, 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 one thought to the next. There's no peace, there's no off switch. And so we, this is why we find refuge. Because this, this is something you can't turn off, you can't just turn off your mind. Because you can't do that, well, we have to find objects that are going to keep us in a good state of mind. Even as Buddhists we do this. Listen to the Dhamma because it keeps you in a good state of mind Practice meditation, of course, because it keeps you in a good state of mind But it's like coddling a baby You have to take care of this young baby Constant, constant, it requires constant uh, interaction, observation Constant uh, monitoring As soon as it takes an object that's a, in a bad way It goes off in a bad way Let it get, let it take sensual pleasures as an object. Oh, it'll go on for, it'll develop all sorts of addictions or aversions, delusions. Nibbana is not like that. Nibbana is the freedom, it's the peace, there's the stability that a meditator realizes, experiences. And that is why enlightenment, that's why it's called enlightenment, that's why enlightenment is so powerful. The essence of it is this stability. Dhammata, the, the third is um, Satcha Vedi, Vedi, one who knows, Veda, knowledge, Vedi, one who knows. Satcha, the truth Satcha Vedi Satcha Vedi Nang Like Siti Nang Two one, two, uh, two one form Satcha Vedi One who knows the truth And of course not just any truth If you know anything about Buddhism You know that the Buddha is not just talking about Knowing the truth about JFK or whether they landed on the moon Or uh, the truth here is the Four Noble Truths The truth of suffering One un understands the truth of suffering Very important you know, People who have experienced truth, experienced suffering, understand this Not they un I don't mean they understand the truth of suffering I mean they understand the importance of it People who haven't, uh, haven't experienced a lot of suffering Are often quite negligent, right? And people who have experienced suffering, great suffering in their lives Will often observe those people and see how negligent they are They won't be able to look at the, at the world often in the same way It often feels like they're traumatized They will describe themselves as being traumatized But often a part of the trauma is wisdom Even though they're not able to deal with what they've understood They've realized something 
and that is that life doesn't allow you to be complacent and that complacency that um, reliance on pleasure and 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 peace and so on is um, is dangerous as a cause for potential drama and suffering on on a, on a great scale you know, these people often are traumatized and unable to live their lives crippled by the unexpected arising of suffering and so it's often missed in Buddhism and, and it's an, it, it can't be stressed enough that the focus in Buddhism is suffering. You know, we might beat around the bush, but we shouldn't. We should just be careful to explain why is our focus suffering, not because we're pessimistic, not at all. Not at all. If anything, Buddhists are optimistic. The idea is we have, we have a way to be at peace, not just realists who say, mm. most people are realists, even though they're optimistic. They will say, suffering is a part of life, you know, and and they by that by that they don't agree with. It's not just we would agree with them. It, they mean mental suffering, you know. Sometimes you're sad, sometimes you're angry. That's just a part of life. Look on the bright side. They think they're optimistic. It's pessimistic. It's terrible to think that you have to get angry sometimes. It's just a part of life. Understandable because it appears that you do doesn't appear that anyone can be free from anger, not unless you really, really um, work hard at it. No? And that's, of course, what we have to do in Buddhism. You really have to work at it. Uh, but the, the most important work is to understand suffering, to become familiar with it. How does it arise? What is its cause? Understanding what, what causes it to cease. The Four Noble Truths. They're noble. They truly are. Hard to understand if you've never done meditation. Hard for non-Buddhists to really appreciate. Often it is a cause for people who have suffered to come to Buddhism because it resonates. They say, yes, this is a part of life. I really would like to know about the cause and understand it better. Very clear. It should be very clear. But it's not mainly because we avoid suffering. We avoid thinking about the potential that I, this might be like, this might be me one day. One day I might suffer like these people are suffering. One day I will get old, sick and die. Oh, avoid that. And we delude ourselves into thinking that we found stability in people and places and things. For someone who has suffered, they it resonates with them. They they realize that they have been negligent. They realize that the familiarity and understanding of suffering would have would have saved them some of that distress. And the fourth um, quality is Atano Kama Kubanang. Kubana is just a variation of Karana. Kara, kara is the to do. One who does one's own work. Doing one's own work. So I think there's three ways we can understand this. The first is in 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 opposition to not doing any work. Some uh, some Buddhists let's focus on Buddhists. So let's criticize us. Some Buddhists don't do much. They might say they're Buddhist. They might talk about Buddhism. They might even repeat some Dhamma teachings that they've heard. They might talk about how great the Buddha is, and so on. They might tell stories about how I met this teacher or that teacher. Talk about their teachers, brag about their teachers, but they don't do any work, right? 
Mahakasapa wasn't such a person, obviously. And obviously that's, that's something we have to guard against, be careful of. It doesn't do us any good to be caught, get caught up in the romantic religious aspects like my teacher or my religion or you know, pretty simple stuff, no? The second thing is doing someone else's work. So if you get caught up in teaching, it's a very common problem among teachers is you get caught up in oh, doing other people's work for them. Concern yourself with other people, trying to teach other, trying to convince other people to practice. It's really the wrong way of going about it. People come to Buddhism, it's not self-evident, but it, it is true that people come to Buddhism not because we proselytize, not because we push the Dhamma on them, but because they see the Dhamma in us. They hear the Dhamma in when we teach and when we speak. And they come based on who we are, you know, based on our development. And so that's where our, our work lies. Not in doing other people's work for them. Not in bringing other people into Buddhism. Let them come. Let those who have eyes see. And the third aspect is, um, what is our work? You know? Doing one's own work as opposed to doing something that isn't one's own work. Because there is a distinction. So as Buddhists, we sometimes focus on things that you might say to some extent are our work, but are not the true duties. The Buddha said there are two duties. Well, we have in the Dhammapada commentary anyway, says the Buddha said there are two duties, study and practice. Study is important because if you just go and practice, how are you going to practice? What are you going to do when you say you're going to practice? Gantatura, to study the texts, memorize them even. Or just get a teaching from a meditation teacher and go practice. That's also valid. As long as you understand the teaching and the teaching is correct, is, is proper, that can be enough. That's the study. We don't have to study everything. We don't, most of us have enough time. Ajahn Tong would say two ways of studying. One is in order, sequence. A to Z, it means study all of the Tipitaka, every piece of the Buddha's teaching. The other way is Sandot, which means just enough. What's enough? You learn the four Satipatthana, memorize the four Satipatthana, Kaya, Vedana, Chitta, Dhamma. You memorize that, that's enough, he said. And then the other work, so, so this is gantatura. The second one is vipassana tura, means practice, but specifically practice to see clearly. Vi means clearly, pasana means seeing, seeing clearly. And I've already talked about that a little bit, but the real work, the work that makes one worthy of respect and generosity and, and appreciation. That work is the work of vipassana, of seeing clearly. You know, the work of cultivating what we might call wisdom in English. Seeing things clearly is a, is a noble quality. The quality that is most worthy of respect. Not how nice you are, or how peaceful you are, but how wise you are, no? How clearly you understand reality, because everything pours from that, everything comes from that. Kindness, generosity, uh, peace, contentment, all of that comes from somewhere. If it doesn't come from seeing clearly, it is lacking in this, this basis in reality, it is lacking in the strength of understanding. But from clarity, from vision, from wisdom, it comes out, come a strength and a power and a certainty in all good things. 
a stability in goodness. You know, all goodness comes from it. All of the worthy qualities come from it. So the activity of studying and practicing, this is the this is what we, the Buddha called one's own work. And so these are the four qualities of Mahakasapa and an enlightened being and four qualities that I think are very important. It's a very good Dhamma teaching for us as meditators. And finally the Buddha said, Tang Jano Kurute Piyang. Such a person is dear to people. So this is the Piyavagga, remember we're talking about holding people dear, holding things dear, well, here we have a different way of looking at that And the point is uh, Someone who is truly proper to hold dear And it's meant in a different way It's not meant that you should cling to that person, of course It's not even really that, I think, meant in the way to, to be understood as um, We should strive for this Because it hold, people will hold us dear It's really just pointing out the reality of it that in the world, we think when we think of why do people hold other people dear, it's usually for for arbitrary reasons. We think, well, they're kind of physically attractive. Maybe they're clever. Maybe they're smart. Maybe they're rich. Maybe they're well dressed. Maybe they're strong mentally or physically. But well, that's a, a good a good example. Mental fortitude, you know, even just mental fortitude, which absolutely is most most evident in one who has practiced meditation, is a very attractive quality. People tend to hold such people dear, as important, as as uh, worth knowing, worth appreciating. And so he's remarking on this, really. He's not saying, uh, do these things because everyone will like you. No, it's not about people liking you. But it's an important point that really, on a much deeper level, especially those people who are all good people themselves, there will be a, a great appreciation for one who is enlightened in these ways. More importantly, of course, it's a, it's a state that is conducive to peace and happiness, freedom from suffering, and perfection of a sort. So, that's the Dhammapada for tonight. Thank you all for listening.